um, things were pretty dead. Well, they weren't. They were extremely lively. People were talking about bombing Iran, and of course they're still talking about bombing Iran today. It's a fashionable thing to do, to talk about bombing Iran. Actually, I think if anyone wants to bomb Iran, they should bomb it with laptops, um, because that's actually what people really yearn for, uh, connectivity. Um, but bonkers, that the supreme leader is a difficult man, that uh, the leadership is divided, that they're corrupt, and that they're, you know, they're messianic and the rest of it. But I'm afraid to say, at the end of the day, um, you know, it is a country which has not invaded another country in 300 years. It's a country which, interestingly, has not yet bombed London or indeed New York or Washington or the Pentagon or more or less anywhere else. Um, and there are plenty of countries that we could point to with whom we have most um, fraternal relations. Iran conjures the most extraordinary kind of reactions. Um, it is a place of unbelievable beauty. It's a place with the most incredible uh, history, culture, depth. I mean, I'm afraid to say that they were working on alphabets when we were crawling on our stomachs in the caves. I mean, that is unfortunately a fact. They, they, they were at it three or four thousand years BC, and if not, slightly more. Um, at any rate, I was there for the revolution, and the revolution was Make no mistake about it, a popular revolution on a massive scale. It's still the biggest movement of people I've ever seen in one place. Millions of people on the street. It was a passionate and it was an Islamic event. I mean, the, it's important to point out at this point that American diplomatic relations with Iran had lasted just 25 years. That is all they ever had. British diplomatic relations with Iran extended back nearly 300 years, 250, 300 years, a very, very long time. Uh, and, and there was great British um, expertise, you know, fluent Farsi speakers on some scale, uh, people who had lived and loved Iran and understood it and, and were, were, were pretty good. But they somehow fell into the slipstream of the way in which America felt about uh, Iran. And the, the revolution was very much against America, not particularly against us, but against America. Uh, and indeed, the Americans, I don't know, Tom, were you excluded? I think you were th thrown out. Most of the American correspondents really experienced in diplomatic terms. The idea that your entire diplomatic corps resident in the country, 52 uh, diplomats, are held hostage. Your ambassador is holed up in the foreign ministry, also held hostage was a completely humiliating experience. And the fact that it wasn't resolved in a day, but took 444 days, was even more humiliating. And the fact that you sent the cream of the marine force uh, to come and rescue them and crashed yourselves in the desert uh, by a completely uh, manufactured own goal. Uh, I went to Desert One. I was one of only two or three of us who actually got there. And when you saw it, it was a much worse disaster than the White House had ever let on. I mean, four helicopters escaped, and they limped out of the country down to the carrier force. The thing was an absolute nightmare, and I think put the crust on uh, the whole sense that America had that they were dealing with something very, very evil. And I believe that the overhang of that uh, humiliation is informing us to this very day. And, and it, it, it's, um, it, it's a devastatingly destructive uh, force. And it's a completely understandable one. Uh, you know, I, again, I don't really think people have ever made any very great effort to try to get to the top. There, the biggest thing about this is esteem. Esteem. Nobody's been prepared to say, look, we don't like what you're doing. We don't even like you. But we respect Iran. We respect your history. We respect your civilization. We respect what you have given us. And history is going to ask, why... The UK, with its history, with its knowledge, with its understanding, with its scholarship, with its Farsi studies in Oxford, Cambridge and beyond, why didn't we do better? What did we get out of the United States that persuaded us that Iran was a thoroughly nasty place and we were going to have nothing to do with it? What, what went wrong? What went wrong? Why did we allow to, ourselves to be the stool pigeon of the understandable... Um, <coughs> shock and horror and hatred that was blooming in America. We should have said to ourselves, hang on a minute, Iran is a very important country. We need to find a way to communicate with these people. And to be the United States, it has to be somebody 
either Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama. One of them has to go. One of them has to take their life in their hands and go. And it wouldn't be too risky, I can tell you. This is a safe place to go. Uh, famous last words, but that it is. <laughs> it is because that's not what it's like. I mean, there is the most appalling uh, violation of human rights to be had any day of the week. That's, that's, that's on the table. But there is no question in my mind that if you are prepared to accept what Iran is, if you are prepared to start from the bottom and say, this is a great country, then you can start to deal with what is not so great. And what is not so great is that it is a shambles at the top. Divided revolutionary guard, too much money in their pockets, too much stranglehold over the economy, uh, division between the supreme leader and the prime minister, the president, to, you know, that, that, that has all the problems we know about because we read about them every, if you simply talk in terms of a nuclear weapon. This is a country that looks west. It looks to us. Our culture infects everything they do. They love our culture within the people. And the people are the people we should be connecting with. We should engage with Iran. We should trade with Iran. Heaven knows, I've been investigating the companies that have been going to the wall in the northwest of Britain uh, because of the sanctions. Little companies that produced widgets that have nothing to do with bombs but are caught by the sanctions. This is mad. This is mad. We've lost our diplomatic rep representation. We're now losing our manufacturing relationship and trade relationship. Britain is bigger than this. Why do we need to do it? We don't believe in sanctions anyway. I mean, everybody's proved that sanctions don't, which gives us real insight into what is possible. Over the last three or four years, the British Museum has managed to stage some of the most remarkable Persian-based exhibitions that have ever been staged anywhere in the world. Some of the most remarkable exhibitions that have ever been staged dealing with such antiquity. And most of the stuff that has come from Tehran has never, ever been out of Iran before. It's come from Persepolis and all sorts of places. And over a period of three or four years, and the relationship continues to this day, pieces have been coming out, scholars have been going in, scholars have been coming out, there has been a traffic, there has been an activity, there's been a conversation, and there has been a very strange kind of cultural freedom. And then it came to the crunch point, when they said, we would like the Saris cylinder. What is the Saris cylinder? It's that size. It has hieroglyphics on it. And those hieroglyphics are the original first ever testament of human rights. And they reside in a glass case in the British Museum. And a facsimile is to be found in the hall outside the chamber of the United Nations. It is the first statement of man's obligation to man, of humankind's understanding of their obligations to the world in which we live. It's a breathtaking tiny thing in which I think there's only about 150 people can even read it because it's in this strange, what, what, what text is it? You know, I know, but there it is. So it has this, this, these, these hieroglyphics. It's, it's a marvelous little thing, but it's only that size. And the British Foreign Office says, this would be very foolhardy indeed. Do not send the, the Saras cylinder. You will never get it back. We did, after all, nick it from Babylon in 1875. <laughs> but you will never get it back. And the trustees of the British Museum, to their huge and courageous credit, said, the Sarah Cylinder goes. And this is the Elgin Marbles. This is, this is Persia's Elgin Marbles. The Sarah Cylinder is flown in its own seat in a, in a beautiful wrapping to Tehran. A place is built, built, huge place, to contain thousands of people and the cylinder sits in the middle and the people of Iran go round it in their hundreds of thousands perhaps a million and what's important about this this is a pre-Islamic piece of culture and one of the things the Islamic revolution has always refused to do is to acknowledge Persia's gorgeous sumptuous intellectual past and here suddenly was the vice president of Iran uh, the then most likely candidate for the presidency, they were all going around and milking it for all they were worth. And what were they milking? A thing which talked about human rights. I mean, that's Iran for you. Um, but but it, it, it was an amazing moment. And then a terrible letter arrived. 
Dear Neil McGregor, uh, we would like to keep the cylinder for another three months until the new year, the Persian new year. And they had to decide, well, we don't have much option, do we? Okay, yes. The day after the Persian New Year, I was summoned to the British Museum with a camera. I arrived in the Persian gallery and I saw a man in white gloves carrying the Cyrus cylinder and putting it back into the box, locking the door, and there it was. If you want something which tells you what is possible in terms of negotiation, you may think, What's a bloody piece of terracotta got to do with trying to mend relations with Iran? It tells us everything because it was redolent with symbolism. It was counter-revolutionary. It was all about human rights, which they're not. All these things were running in opposite directions and whew, they did it. They got it. They did it and they got it. So anyway, there it is. I want to tell you that that's a wonderful thing and that is a great pointer to what is possible. Heaven knows how it can be done. But I do believe that, that it must be done, because if it is not done, if we do not engage, and if Britain doesn't begin to assert itself independently about what they really understand of Iran, we're going to live in ever more dangerous times. Because we need Iran for our presence in Afghanistan, for our residue in Iraq, for our need in Syria, for the Middle East. This, there is no solution to anything in that region without Iran. We must rethink Iran. I'm a journalist and I'm not really allowed to have opinions, so I have no opinion. <laughs> but, but the Tim Garden Memorial Lecture has allowed me to have a view. And my view is engage, engage, engage at every level. And if you're a tourist, go, it's so safe. Go to Isfahan, it's the Florence of the East. Thank you very much.